heart out off your bike on her. <laughs> Buddy. There we go. Well, I'm sorry you have to listen to me, but that's, they're, they're scratching the barrel. Uh, first thing we're going to do, we're going to, I need to help the Holy Spirit. How about you? Huh? Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit into this house. And Father, I confess, I need you. I just need you big tonight, big tonight. I just pray that you'd open every ear to hear and every heart to receive. And I pray that everything I give them would be a blessing. I'm doing something I've never done before. And I told this to Ben quite some time ago, in fact. And he said, you need to do it. I've never given my testimony. Our testimony. It just ain't mine. It's ours. Uh, I started my career in 1962, probably in the wildest place on earth at that time. And that was leading Deadwood, South Dakota. I become an underground miner. I'm underground mine for over 40 years. And I thank God I'm still alive. Because I spent 20 years out here, in this hole out here. But I stayed in Leiden Deadwood for almost nine years, eight, nine years. And then I could spend probably the next hour telling you all the miracles God did for me underground. Only thing kept me alive was angels. In fact, the last place we come from, a couple of my friends called me the angel man because I readily see angels. You gotta learn how to do that. You cannot see them this way because they travel at a different speed than we see. You always see them on your periphery and I like using them. I love using angels. I've used them all my life. Once they saved me, first time they saved me underground, so when I learned to use them. And I stayed in Leed and Edward was my first marriage until 1968, well in fact, 67 I become a bachelor raising two boys. And in 1968 I was out cruising my new car. I had a new 442 Olds and I loved it. And I was cruising leading Deadwood, and I found these four college girls cruising Deadwood. They was up cruising De De Deadwood County. Deadwood's a big tourist trap is what it is. And uh, that's where I met this young lady called Rhonda. Uh, it was the spring of the year. It was the spring of the year, the Friday night. Uh, she liked my car because it was her fa it was her favorite color, and that's red. And uh, we cruised around a little bit, and uh, I seen him go into the what's called a Ranger Bar. It ain't even there anymore. Oh yeah, I'm I, I'm not holding back. Uh, they went in there, so I parked and went in, and there was four of them sitting in a booth, and you could tell none of them knew how to drink. And I, I knew very well how to drink. I was very good at it, too good. And I walked up to the bar, and Rhonda was sitting on the edge, so she walked to the bar, and she ordered a red beer for all four of them. I said, yeah, that's going to work. One, one glass of red beer for all four girls, three straws. <laughs> so I, 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 bought them, I bought them a beer, and I got to talking to Rhonda. I mean, she came up and ordered it. It told me right away they didn't know what to do. And I talked with her for a little bit, and uh, it must have been getting close to their See, She was going to college at that time, and they had a curfew. And they were getting a little antsy, and uh, so I went and I asked her if I could give her a ride back to Spearfish, which was 17 miles away, is where the College of South Dakota State is. And uh, she said yes. So I gave her a ride over there. I figured I'd get to cruise a little bit with her, but I couldn't because curfew was about up. So I took her to the dorm where I didn't know where it was at, but I found out. Uh, I was headed out of Spearfish the first time I'd ever heard the Lord in my life. Didn't know him. 
And a voice beside me said, you just talk to your future wife. In fact, it was so life, I turned to look, because I thought, sure, there was somebody sitting in the seat. It was that loud. And I said, huh, that's interesting. What do I do now? So Saturday, I was off Saturday and Sunday. So I go back over to the dorm, and she didn't want to see me. But I kept hanging around until she come down. And we dated then for a short period of time. Well, we didn't date very long because in August <laughs> of 68, we got married. <laughs> Lord had a plan. It's amazing when the Lord has plans. He puts stuff together rather quick. And it was August 17th. Huh. Here we are coming up on what? 54 years, huh? Man, time flies, huh? Well, we stayed in Leeds until 1970, spring of 1970. Real spring, March. I said I was sick of snow. I don't like snow. Never did like snow. I was born and raised in Minnesota. And then I moved to Leeds, South Dakota, where they get 140, 150 inches a year. Then. They don't now, but they did then. And I said, if my contract is up and the pass to the south is open, I'm out of here. And that year, 1970, spring, was a good spring. They opened the pass. See, they had to blow it out to get through it. It was that deep in that pass. Or you had to drive like 150 miles around to get out. And we come down here. I happen to know some people who had come here, and they were then supervisors here that come out of lead. So we come down here, and we had some friends that our neighbors, their sons were living here. And we come down to visit them. And I went out to the, I asked them if they were doing any hire, and I went out here to the mine. And they said, yeah, I think they are. So I called out there, and I called 33. Jim Meisner was the superintendent, and I knew Jim. He was from Leet, and I got a job, no doubt. But anyway, make things short and quick, we're going to move along. We moved here in 1970, joined the First Presbyterian Church on Nimitz. And that's where I gave my life to the Lord. Wasn't long after we were here. I'd done like a lot of you, I've said them words. And while we were there, uh, it was close to 19, well, well, we were there for about five years, six years, seven probably. In 1976, the spring, March again, a lot of things happened with me, with the Lord, on dates and times, so you'll notice that. It was March 13. Christ for the Nations come to town. They got invited into that church. There were two people in that church born again. Two. And filled with the Spirit. Thursday and a Friday night. It was good. Very good. But anyway, on Saturday night, I was partying. I was partying hard till 1.30 in the morning on Saturday night. God showed up in my house. God showed up in my house. I mean, literally showed up. 30 minutes, I was dead sober. And I'm the kind of person you got to show me God said, it's time. I said, you show me. He took me out in the backyard. He drew a circle, about 20 foot in diameter. It rained, it snowed, it hailed. It did everything the, the, that the world does in that circle. I said, you're God, you can do anything you want to. Then he lifted me up about five, six feet in the air. And he says, is that enough? I said, yeah, that's enough. And he took me back in the house. I probably spent the next two hours on the floor crying. 
I spent the next hour and a half pouring out liquor. I, told, I was an alcoholic. I drank hard. I had a bigger booze refrigerator than I had a food refrigerator. I bought whiskey by the gallons. I bought beer by the kegs. I didn't fool around. In fact, if I'd have kept going, I'm sure I'd, I'd be gone today. I wouldn't have a liver left. It just wouldn't happen. But anyway, that was on Saturday night. I don't think I slept for two or three days. I was high. Very high. Not only did he save me, he filled me with the spirit and fire. I think that's the important thing, is fire. I couldn't wait for Sunday morning. See, I was sitting on the board of that church for the last three, four years. When I got to church, boy, I was ready to see my friends, my other guys on the board. Guess what happened to them at 1.30 in the morning? The same thing happened to them. Four of us, men, sitting on that board, all, and our wives, all got filled with the Holy Spirit and fire. And here, here's, here's the good part. There was, there was ten of us that got saved that night. Guess who the other two were? The pastor and his wife. He'd been all the way through seminary and hadn't been filled with that spirit. Boy, was that an interesting time in that place. I'm telling you what. The Holy Spirit sat us down. In fact, we had like a little meeting before church. Because church was dead as a doornail there. It's a social church. I think it still is. It's just a social church. It's not there to feed. It's not there to green people. It's just a social church. Well, that quit that day. Because the pastor couldn't stand doing what he was doing anymore. So we started meeting on Saturday night. And that went over like a lead balloon. And that was interesting because that only went on for a couple of days. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of us guys and, and, and the Holy Spirit told me and Rhonda, if you'll start a cell group, You start a cell group with the 10. I'll show up every Friday night for one hour. That's what he told us. Literally told us. So we started a cell group in our house. And boy, did it get interesting. The Lord started us in the New Testament. Took us plumb through the New Testament that year. Every miracle, everything done, he showed us how to do. He not only, we not only studied it, but he showed us how to do them. And what to do if we come into that in our walk. Which I thought was very interesting. Because I don't know how many nights, how many nights we got so caught up in the Lord, we'd look out the windows in the front of the house and it'd be daylight. We'd been there all night. Felt like an hour. Now, how many times my good, my, my next door neighbor across the street was my fishing buddy. I don't know how many times I'd come out on Saturday morning, he'd see me out in the yard and he'd come over, let me smell you. Why do you want to smell me? He said, I can't believe your house is still standing. He said there was flames on top of it all night long. And it would get so hot in that house. We'd have, you know, it was in the winter. We'd have the doors open, the windows open, and, and the rafters were sitting there popping because it was so full of the Holy Ghost. Boy, we had fun. I'm telling you, it was so good to be in his presence. In that, there's a difference of presence, and then there's a difference when it's overfilled that you can feel him, you can smell him. See, that's one, one advantage I had that a lot of people didn't have underground. <laughs> Sometimes they could smell me when I come out to go up. What's that odor on you? Because he's very sweet. 
I'll guarantee you, you smell something very, 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 very sweet. You know he's very close. Something good is about to happen. About to happen. Well, that went on for a couple of years. And during this first, this year, when we got, when Jesus raised his brother from the dead, guess what happened? I got a phone call one Saturday afternoon. One of the five, his wife, called me. You need to come down here. He had a business here in town. In fact, it's in the corner, on the corner of going to Randy's, corner of 5th Street, where his business was at that time. You need to get down here. Ken's had a heart attack, and I ain't so sure he isn't dead. I, the word says, you need prayer. You call on the elders of the church, anoint him with oil, and lay hands on him, and he will answer. That's what it says. We just got done studying it. I go down there, and here he is, sitting in a chair. I mean, he can talk, barely. And I say, Ken, what do you want me to do? He says, take me home. I have to drive right by the hospital to take him home. I said, you sure you don't want me to take you to the emergency room? No, we're going to do what the Word says to do. So we did. I took him home, put him in a chair, got in his house, told his wife, I need the oil, because I didn't carry oil. We carry oil now. I learned after that one there, we carry oil. She had no oil in that house. No cooking oil? None. You know what we use for oil? Dipstick out of a car. <laughs> That's how green we were. We didn't know. We just knew what the Word said. The Word says you anoint him with oil and pray for him. You lay hands on him, pray for him, and then don't doubt is what it exactly says. And Ken was about gone. I mean, he was just, you, you couldn't even talk anymore. No, I didn't oil, laid hands on him, and I turned and I walked out of that door, and I went home. I knew if I stood there and watched him, I was going to doubt. And I didn't dare doubt. He's my friend. That was Saturday. Guess where it was Sunday morning? In church again, waiting for him to come through the door. And he did. He said, I can't believe you turned and walked away. I can't believe. He said, I was on my way to heaven. He said, I had, I, angels were there on each side of me. I was gone. I was going to heaven. He's now a pastor in Gallup. That's where he is. Out of these five guys here, out of those five, three of them are pastors today. Three of them are pastors today. It's real interesting. And out of the ladies, it's real interesting. Almost all of them become teachers and prayer warriors. I mean hard prayer warriors. That's where the key is. It's in the prayer. Sometimes our actions, if it lines up with the word, in prayer. Huh? Well, we stayed there for, I don't know, a few years, not very long. Then we went to First Baptist on Mountain Road. That was, every church we've been to has been a step up, up in the spirit. We went there. And it was uh, moving and shaking. They had a big youth group. I mean a big one. They had a spirit-filled pastor there with them youth that were going strong. And when we went there, we got a, a school going there. Rhonda taught in that school for 10 years. Christian school. In fact, there was only two in this town at that time, and we was one of the big ones which I thought was interesting. Rhonda only had one thing she wanted to do with her students in a year. And she insisted on doing it. Get them all born again and filled with the Spirit. See, there's a big difference between born again and filled with the Spirit. There's a big gap there. 
And I should have said this back. I might back up a little bit. See, because I had prayed that prayer at that First Presbyterian Church several years before. Still had that veil over my eyes concerning the Word. The, the Word then was just another storybook. Didn't mean much. But after that night, that thing come alive. I couldn't read it enough. I couldn't get enough of it. Ernie Hart got... Ernie Hart was the one I called that had been pastoring us in that church. Ernie and his wife in First in First Presbyterian Church, every, every Sunday, you couldn't sneak out a door. They weren't there waiting for us. They kept after me and Ron, and two, three of us. They knew. See, they were filled with the Spirit. There's only once in the whole church filled with the Spirit. But we knew who to call. At 1.30 in the morning, she called him. Yeah. That's when it got interesting. That word come alive. And he had a, a restaurant. It's right on right where All Sup sits and I right now today on Santa Fe in First Street. He had a restaurant right there. And I had a King James Bible. I had to go find it. And I had to dust it off. Because I'd never used it. And I had a hard time reading it. So I went to see Ernie. What Ernie did is he gave me his Bible. He said, read all the red letters in the New Testament. Go to the New Testament. Just stay in the New. Read all the red letters and the underline. So I did that. I had it probably a day. And I took it back to him. I said, I read them all. What do I do now, Ernie? Well, he says, take, go home, read your Bible. I said, that thing I don't understand. He says, go find one. Buy one. You do understand. I went and got a living Bible. And that thing just come alive. See, in that first year, we used our Bibles a lot. I don't know how many times, how many I wore out. A few. We used them. And we practiced it. <laughs> but I'm getting off crew. I should have said I might end up in <laughs> way off yonder land. <laughs> but in 19, we stayed at First, Press, uh, First Baptist for 10 years, and now I was on the board of that church again. In fact, that hall they got, that was one of the last things we voted to do before we left, to build that youth hall. We had a big youth. It was doing good. But in 1990, the mine shut down. And we moved to northern Nevada, another mining camp. I got used to mining camps. If you've never lived in a mining camp, boy, you're lucky. There, when we moved to Battle Mountain, Nevada, the population was maybe 300, maybe. There was no place to live. Two little tiny grocery stores, I mean tiny. And three bars, or four, and three restaurants, I think. That was it. That's all there was in that town. That was it. In fact, 17 of us, they come down here to hire us when we signed up for unemployment in 1990. The mining outfit up there come down to hire us, and 17 of us went up there. First thing they asked, any of us had RVs. It was January when we went up there. They were living in tents across from the bar on Main Street in, in Battle Mountain, in the snow. That's what, there was no place to live. There were, mo, there was only two motels in town and they were full. What the mining company would do is they'd hire somebody in rent a motel room and pay for their motel. There was no place to live. And what they did is they'd come in and they put in, oh, a big place to put mobiles. Double wide mobiles, probably four or five hundred of them. That town went from 300 to several thousand in a year, year and a half. Very interesting. But when we went there, we ended up at First Baptist. Well, that's where we come out of, First Baptist. So we went there, and it wasn't there very long. There it was on the board again. Yeah. 
And I was kind of a handyman at that time. And we put a little addition on that church. In fact, we put about 2,300 square feet onto that church. And while we were doing that, Rhonda was teaching Sunday school, junior high kids. We had a pastor there that liked preaching. He liked to preach. But he didn't, when it got to, the, say, in the New Testament, where it got to healing and stuff, he'd preach it, but don't practice. But anyway, it was just that we'd finished up that 2,300 square foot, just about done with it, was just finishing up the wiring. Rhonda was teaching junior high. And it just so happened that two of his kids were in that class. And uh, if you know First Baptist, they send you Sunday school material. It happened to be the book of Acts. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Couldn't have been the worst one for her, him. Ron to teach them the book of Acts. In fact, they got right deep into the word in the book of Acts. And them kids were high school age. They were really interested in that. See, Daddy preaches it. But we don't practice any of that. Don't, none of that happened. So they got to asking a lot of questions, and Rhonda says, Well, let me give you some homework. Go home and study this and get your Bible out and see if it isn't true. If it ain't true, we won't study it no more. We'll go on. Well, they did. They went home and they studied. Here they come next Sunday. And uh, she taught them further on that. And boy, they really got interested. Because see, then they started praying for each other. And, huh, things started happening. Huh. And so them kids went home and started asking dad and mom a whole lot of questions about the book of Acts. And that they were just praying for each other. And it was working. It was working. So Rhonda said, go home and try it. Take it to school and try it. Well, that week, Rhonda gets a call. She needs to come to the office. He told her, you won't be teaching that anymore. And she says, why not? It's what this church orders in. Well, after you go through the book of Acts, it just gets better, don't it? Uh, and she says, no, I'm going to do what the Holy Spirit is telling me to do. And we're going to finish this curriculum. It was going to be over this next week. And then we'll move on to the next one. Oh, boy. Yeah. Them kids got into it. They went to school. They were laying on hands. Hey, there was kids getting healed. There was kids getting born again. Huh. And, and they come home and told mom and dad. Huh. She got another call. In fact, we both got a call. Come into the office. And when she, we walked in, his blood vessel in his neck was sitting there pulsing. So we knew it probably wasn't going to be good. In fact, that was one of the first churches we were asked to leave. And we did. It was a blessing. We didn't think so at the time, but it was a blessing. And, and it was interesting because we went to the only other church. We didn't know where to go. We had no clue. There was only three, maybe four churches in town. But there was one we never, we knew there was, this one was here when we were here in, in, the, in, the, in the early years. We'd never been here. But there was an assembly of God there. And we got to know some people, so we went over there. Hey, that was quite an upgrade. Hey, they actually got praising. They were having a good time. Huh? The spirit was in the house. Hey, we hadn't built spirit in the house. It was good. Uh, <laughs> and we were there <clears throat> not too long. And that pastor left. And uh, the board of that church 
brought in another guy by the name of Ray Northern. I'd love to know where he's at today, if he's even alive. Ray Northern. He was out of Woodland, California. And Ray had, was very sensitive to the Spirit. Very sensitive to the Spirit. And he could read your book. You walk through the door, you'd probably get in about 10 feet, and he'd know exactly who you were and what you were doing. He was that. He was very sensitive to the Spirit. And he had been there, how long do you think, dear? A month or two before the, it was a Wednesday night. In fact, the church, almost identical to this, almost identical. It was a Wednesday night, was having a good time, small church. I don't think we were, what, 50, maybe? 50 people. It was a Wednesday night, he was preaching away, and two people walked in, a man and his wife. They come in, they went down, they sat in that second or third row, second row. They sat in the second row. And you could tell right away the woman was in trouble. She was in big trouble. In fact, he, he just quit preaching. He knew. He knew a medic before she ever sat down. She was in big trouble. In fact, she was going home. She was going to die next few days. He said, Rhonda, and what's her name? Can't think of her name. What was you to pray for? He called on two, three of the prayer warriors, which was Rhonda and two others. You go and anoint her with oil and pray for her. So they did. He just went back to preaching. They went over and laid oil on her, laid hands on her, prayed for her. Didn't know who they were. Didn't have a clue who they were. Church got over, he was doing a little better, they left. That's when it got really interesting in town. Well, by Sunday, we found out they were pastors of a Lutheran church in that town. They did not believe in laying out of hands, period. Wasn't happening. Or was it Methodist? Methodist, wasn't it? Methodist church. Well, Saturday, this woman had to go see her doctor. See, she had terminal cancer. When she walked out Wednesday, they told her she had maybe 10 days. Maybe. At the outside, 10 days. She went to see her doctor. The first thing they'd do is take blood. Took her blood, put her in the room. Doctor come in, looked at it. He said, got all mad. He said, man, they can't do nothing right. He took her blood. He left. Half an hour later, come back. He said, I can't believe this. He said, what happened to you? She said, what do you mean, what happened to me? Well, said, according to this blood thing, you don't have cancer anymore. She says, do you want to repeat that? Yeah, he says, you don't have cancer anymore, according to this blood work. Your blood's clean. Where she was, she come back to our church and tell us. You know what her question was? How do we tell our church what just happened here? Why do we tell them? Because they're going to ask us to leave. She goes, it. When that started happening in her church once before, the other pastor was asked to leave. But boy, did it break out something in our church. See, God started showing up on a very regular basis. Every time we were holding church, God was there. In the next month or two, I don't know how many cancer, terminal cancer patients, we healed. We didn't heal. He did. That word spread through that little town like wildfire. It got so hard, we was packed out. Every Sunday, they wanted to see what was going to happen next. We seen every miracle you could see. We seen legs grow. We seen... About every miracle you could see happening and going on. Man, was it good to be in his presence. It was just good. It's got so the excitement was, I can't wait till Sunday or Wednesday just to go to church. Because it got so darn good in his presence. <laughs> well, Ray Northern was quite a guy. The first thing he did, 
he got men's group like Frank is doing. He took us to men's retreats. I still remember the first one I went to. I was pretty new because I was just born again here not long. Huh? I didn't know a lot of stuff about what God's doing. But anyway, he took us to a men's retreat and uh, Bethel Redding headed out. Bill Johnson, if you've been doing our Thursday night study, that's who was heading up these men's retreats. All Northern California. And that first one we went to, it was in a, oh, it wasn't in a room this big. It wasn't this big. And it was packed up. And the Holy Ghost got so thick in that place that night. In fact, we didn't sleep that night. We just didn't. We, did. we went to go to sleep and couldn't stay there. We had to come back. And the next morning, there, there was a there was a a walkway, probably thirty feet away from that building. And, and the anointing was so strong in that building that it would lay you down. You'd just be walking along and just lay you down. It was that good. We couldn't wait for the next day because they're going to do it that night again. Huh? We started early. Because the place, we were all sitting there waiting. Come on, let's get going. It was great. And the teacher was a, called him, I don't remember what his name was. They called him the man in black. You remember Johnny Cash? Huh? He dressed just like Johnny Cash, the black veil. Very prophetic. This guy spent an hour and a half, two hours in the prophetic realm prophesying over everybody in the group. I mean, nailing them down. I mean, we, I never seen prophetic, ever. Didn't even know the word. And we were wanting to be early, so we were early because we learned. When you went to Reading, you got in the front, as close to the front as you could get. You wanted to be in the anointing. Because the first four or five rows, the anointing got so strong. It was so good. So we got there early, and I was in the second row. I think I'd seen Bill Johnson once before. Once. Kind of. Didn't know him. But we were sitting there waiting, and uh, in walked Bill with this guy in black. Didn't know who he was. Still don't remember his name. But anyway, oh, I better watch it. I'm running out of time. When he got done preaching, he come back and he looked at me and he told me, he says, you, you're, there's three people that are very close to you that you're either going to have to raise from the dead or they're dead. They're gone. They're dying. Three that are very close to you. And he said, maybe four. I learned real quick who they were. First one was my neighbor, my fishing buddy. My neighbor across the street that come and asked me if I smell like smoke. He was the first one. I led him to the Lord. When probably three weeks later, he was gone. <laughs> the next one was my dad. And I'd like to back up here a, way, a long ways. When you're first born again, I would not suggest we, all of us five did this. We said we wanted to see every miracle and do them. We wanted to see them and do them. I suggest you don't do that. I suggest that very strong you don't do that. Because usually it's going to be somebody very close to you. Very close to you. Well, I got to lead my dad to the Lord. Next one was my uncle. And I didn't get a chance to lead him to the Lord. And a year later, I went back to another conference I guess who the speaker was? The man in black. Guess who the fifth one was going to be? He said he was. Three times that year he tried to commit suicide. Three times. Huh? If you've been in our study, Bill warned about the prophetic realm. Sometimes it can get pretty heavy if you're into it heavy. But anyway, I'm going to, I am running out of time. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one more, I'm going to give you one more quick one. 
It's the one that grew me and Rhonda probably the most of anything that ever happened, any of the miracles that ever happened to us. If you're a parent, like we are, you hate those calls in the middle of the night. We got one of those calls. Probably about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was at work. I was at night jail. I got a call about 3 in the morning. Rhonda called me. Our daughter had a complete nervous breakdown and tried to take her entire family away. You got to remember, she hated guns. My daughter wouldn't even let her son play with a toy gun. Her husband was a police officer. And she asked him to take him, and he wouldn't do it. So she got him with his gun, and she was going to. The only thing we knew is that she had tried. That's all we knew. They were living in St. George, Utah. And if you know anything about Utah, that's the second Salt Lake City. That's where the head of the, the Salt Lake City pastor took his first wife and put her in St. George and built her a temple. Very heavy Mormon town. Very heavy. So, Rhonda called me. I got off work. We head for St. George. We go by the house. Yellow tape. Police officer met us at the curb. You can't come in. Only thing we wanted to know, we didn't know if our son-in-law was alive and our grandson was alive. Yeah, they're alive. That's all they told us. Where is she at? Excuse me. She's at the prison just about six, seven miles north of here. Okay, so we head out there. We park in the parking lot, big parking lot, big prison. Across the top, it's the name of it is Purgatory, the name of this prison. We walk in the front door, there's a sign this big, painted on the wall in yellow with bright letters, red letters. No one will see any prisoner for the first 30 days. <laughs> Boy, that ain't going to work. I walk over to the desk. How can we help you? We told them who we wanted to see. And this lady says, do you see the sign? I says, yes. She says, that it, it means exactly what it says. Okay, I thanked her and I says, Lord bless you. And I turned to walk out the door and I grabbed Rhonda's hand, both of us. See, if you learn how to listen in the spirit, you don't have to say something out loud. You know what they're saying. We prayed this. Lord, me and you have a problem. We got a prison we can't get into. Back to the house we go. We can't do nothing there. They won't let us. They're still crampsy. Well, to shorten it up, we go to find a motel. We get in this motel. Here we go back to 1.32 in the morning. Like earlier, here it is again. Phone rings in our room. Rhonda answers it. She says, are you so-and-so? Rhonda says, yes, I am. She says, you be here at this prison at quarter to 10 in the morning, and you go sit in this particular spot in the waiting room. There's a big waiting room. Probably seats 40 or 50. You go sit in this particular spot. Yes. Whew. We come alive. No more sleeping that night. huh? Because we were praying anyway. Boy, that's when I come alive. We were early at the prison. And we go and we sit by this door. And there was guards going in that door and it slammed shut and you could hear the locks clicking shut. Interesting. And I said, man, place I don't like to be. But this is where God's got us. We wait and we wait and we wait. Felt like eternity. Pretty soon, this lady comes out. She says, are you so-and-so? Glenn and Rhonda. Yes, we are. Follow me. In we go. We go down this long hall, and there's doors going in. And we get to this one. She says, you go in here, and you go to the third chair, and you sit there and wait. And uh, so we go in there and sit there, and here's this plexiglass, dark, nothing there. If I wait 15, 20 minutes, pretty soon a light comes on. 
In comes our daughter. She looked terrible. She was in trouble. Big trouble. So we started ministering to her. I'll tell you, they listen. They listen. See, we weren't even supposed to be in there. They listen. I'll guarantee you they were listening. Another big sign on the wall, 30-minute limit. Hour and 45 minutes later, we left. She left that booth because we weren't leaving long. She was in the booth. Hour and 45 minutes later. Boy, that's when it got interesting. Because when we went out, we started blessing guards. Because I'll tell you, remember the first few lessons Bill Johnson taught? You load up with Jesus. Get it on you. Get it on you. Well, we would load up. I mean load up. That's what we called it. Because my best friend asked me, what did you do, Glenn? We just loaded up on God. We just downloaded all of God we could get until you could feel it. You could literally see it and feel it. So we left. Next day, we was back. See, I was working four on, four off. Four on, four off. So we spent, well, the first day we lost. Second day we were there. Got in the third day. And they told me, well, we had to go back home because we had some things we had to take care of to get back to work. But the second day, we walked in and walked to the window. I thought, they're going to tell us to go back out. No, no. Huh? They started feeling the Holy Spirit of God on us. And we started blessing them once there. Here we go again. Two hours we was with her. Then we'd go home and we'd load up on God again and back we'd come. And, and just to shorten this thing up because it just kept getting better and better. Because after about the second or third trip, they would know what time we were going to be there. They would be there holding the door open. Because they wanted some of the anointing that was on us. In fact, the anointing got so hard once we were coming and she was, you get this, she had five felonies. Five. Five felonies. <laughs> shooting in the city limits, shooting at a police officer. And, you know, it just goes on and on. It wasn't good. But this time we was running just a little while. Well, it's, it's 350 miles from our house to that prison. 350 miles. And I'd get off at 7, get off at 6 in the morning. And we'd be there. See, you had to be there by 1.30. That was visiting time, one thirty, But anyway, they had court. We knew. And this is another miracle. What is the chances of all five? See, they take you to court on every charge, every charge. Every one of them landed on a day's off. Go figure. Talk about God doing things. God does miracles all the time. A lot of times we just miss them. But this time we was running a little late. And our daughter had made mention she needed a Bible. So I'd, we run by Walmart because it was on the way. I dropped her at the door and I parked. There was a second parking spot right there. It was empty. And a guy just pulled in in the next one. I, ran in, I parked and I was going to run in after. And this guy beside me got out and he started to walk behind his pickup. He just made the corner of the back of his pickup when I hit the end of mine. The anointing on me was so strong, he just went skidding down the parking lot. And I was six feet away from him. Six feet away from him. That's why I said, you can download all the God you want. It actually comes into the physical. It really does. Because I, I said, oh, my goodness, I went to help this guy up. And he said, oh, my goodness, don't, don't stay away from me. He said, what in the world is that on you? That was his exact words. What's that on you? Huh? And it got real interesting because every time she was in court, we, there was only a few chairs, two rows of chairs in this courtroom. And we'd always be sitting right behind the pedestal, the thing just like this. They'd have to come in. They sat along the wall, and they'd come into a thing like this in front of the judge. 
We always made sure it was right behind that. <coughs> prayer works, folks. I'm telling you, prayer works. We did this for five, five sessions. It just happened to me. We were there. And I'm going to skip two. And during, right at the end of this, our son-in-law now was they were divorcing, and so I helped my son-in-law move out. All people watch you, whether you know or not. People are watching how we act and what we do. I helped move him out, move his whatever he wanted out to where he was going to live. And then the final one come, court date. This is when it really gets good. Because during this whole time, we were going to a little church that just started in that town. Brand new church. Spirit-filled church. Not Mormon. Spirit-filled church. And it was really starting to move and shake. And we were having fun because, see, on the weekends, we could only spend an hour or so in that prison. We had a lot of time. We were at that church having fun. Things were really getting good in that church. And that pastor got to know us pretty well. In fact, he, when it come to sentencing, in fact, the last couple of times we even went to him, he, he was along with a couple of his people, prayer warriors. But this last one we got real interesting because when we went, we was really loaded up. And so was his church members. They were loaded up on God. I mean, tell you, we walked in the room. You knew we were in the room. I mean, that entryway, we was having a revival going on in the, in, in, the, in the foyer. I mean to tell you. And my daughter was over there and her attorney was there and she was crying and she was telling him, no, I'm not, we're not doing that. That's not what I'm called to do. It's not what I'm called to do and be. And I don't know how many times he'd leave. Several times. He went out of the room and he'd come back. And we just kept praising God. We just kept bringing the anointing into the building. And then the attorney come back out and he said, it's time to go in. So Rhonda got in one side of my daughter and I got in the other. And when we went in, we walked in the, with the podium. See, you weren't allowed in there. There was a wall there. You couldn't go in there. And I was on one side of her and Rhonda was on the other, holding her hand. And the judge looked up and he asked me a question. What is your intention of doing with your daughter? I thought, <laughs> at a sentencing, huh? I says, our intention is we're going to take her back to Nevada. We already got a good Christian counselor. I mean a good one. Christian counselor. We know he's good. Because we want to spend some time finding out. Good one. It pays to get good ones. <laughs> and that's when it really got good in that house. He said, I can't believe what I'm going to do right now. The judge says, I turn her over to your custody. Okay. I says, can I leave the state with her? Yes, you can, he said. Do I have to bring her back to check in? No. I said, I can leave with her, take her out of state, and not bring her back. Yes. And her attorney said, let's go out this door. We'd never been out that door before. It was a side door going out to the front. Guess what else followed this out? The judge and everyone in that room, even the prisoners, they come out. You know what they asked? What was that in the courtroom? The judge says, what was that in our courtroom? What was that? I've never felt that before. I said, you just felt the presence of God. You just felt the presence of God. And we had a revival in that entryway like you won't believe. We went home the next day. We went to load our daughter's stuff up. People watch us, I'm telling you. They watch hard. Every one of her neighbors come over. 
They are all hard Mormons. Very hard Mormons. They wanted to know how we did that. And where do you go to church? They wanted to know where do I go to church? Because you got something we never seen before. That's when we found out her neighbor right across the street <laughs> was the doctor treating her in prison. <laughs> Guess where he ended up? In that church. Hmm? All five, John, and Jordan. All five, yeah, or a race. Huh? God is great. One more lesson we got left tomorrow night. I want to, I got two more pages, but I ain't want to quit. But I, I want to tell you something. Our next study is going to get very interesting. It's, we're going to take a break for a while. We got another study, and it's going to get really good. It's uh, stepping off into the prophetic realm. Yeah, okay. That's all I got. Thank you, Greg. <laughs>